Um, so today I want to talk about assembly the web with WebAssembly. This is supposed to be sort of something like, what? What is this? And um, uh, yeah, this is about using WebAssembly for things that you probably hadn't thought about using it before. Uh, for. Um, so just to give you a little background, I will uh, use a bunch of terms and just so that you know what I mean when I say the different things. I work on the V8 project. The V8 project actually contains two other projects. So V8 is actually a component in Chrome. That's probably that's where it got its sort of um, where it was first launched, and it's a core component of Chrome. Um, but it has sort of two sub technologies in it. It's got the ECMAScript stamp, which is JavaScript, and the other one is WebAssembly. So it has an engine to um, execute both. If I'm not careful, I will actually use some of these interchangeably, so just be aware of this. Um, I, the V8 for me means both of these things, because both of these technologies are part of V8 and in Chrome. Um, I'd like to first talk a little bit about what WebAssembly is. Uh, many of you are probably aware of, <laughs> of what it is, but I would like to provide a little more information in the context for the rest of the presentation. Um, these questions are a bit rhetorical, why would you need it and how can you use it? But I would like to use that as sort of a foil to, to do a little bit of a, a playful experiment and show you what you can do if you think outside of the box with WebAssembly. <clears throat> Am I talking too fast? Who says, who thinks I'm talking fast? It's a trick question. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what is WebAssembly? Um, the light from above, it is a powerful new technology that enables developers to build experiences on the web that were simply never feasible in the past. And this is where the angels say. <laughs> but it's true, right? Um, this is the marketing speak that you'll get. Um, I think in a sort of low-level technical way. So when I think about it, um, I think of WebAssembly, what I think is really cool about it um, is that it's a binary instruction format for a stack-based virtual machine. Oh boy, that's like a lot better. <laughs> Fewer angels singing. And um, so what does this all mean when I say stack-based? Who has ever implemented computer language here? Oh, right on. Okay. Yeah. Um, I can ask the question, who has it? I guess that's somebody else. Um, so stack-based, um, here in this context means if you use WebAssembly, it's easy to actually generate code for WebAssembly in a mechanical way. So if you're writing a compiler, it's easy to generate WebAssembly code. Um, and specifically, and I'll get back to this, through recursive tree visits. Does anybody know here what an AST is, an abstract syntax tree? Oh, whoa, awesome, awesome. <laughs> um, and uh, this uh, sort of binary instruction format for a virtual machine, mm, what does that mean? Um, think of it as a cross-platform assembly language and a file format for it, right? So you can imagine, you take a WebAssembly file, you run it through V8, again, here's I'm conflating I'm conflating a couple things here. You run it through the WAP, uh, WASM uh, component of V8, and you get um, code out the other side that runs on specific architectures, and that code is optimized to run well on those architectures. Make sense? Yeah? Okay. So um, specifically, um, many of the WASM instructions translate one-to-one -one into the machine instructions that you will get on the target machine. Make sense? Yeah. Pretty straightforward. Um, so when you... When you run a WASM program inside of uh, Chrome, you not only get this really nice translation service to the machine language on the target platform, but you also get all of the nice benefits of the Chrome sandbox, the security model, all of sort of the, the things that Chrome provides in addition to just the raw execution. So that's kind of nice. Um, so how this works in practice, this is probably the model that you're most familiar with if you know uh, WebAssembly is that you start with a C++ file, you run it through Clang, um, it, that can generate, if you use the right combination of tools, a WASM file, you would feed that to V8, and you can then execute it inside of Chrome. Make sense? Okay. Why do you need it? Well, okay. Um, so clearly, uh, there's this use case that many of you are familiar with, running it with uh, C++ programs, taking those C++ programs, cross-compiling them for the web. But I'd like to give you a little more provocative uh, sort of a, a thought experiment of what you could use it for that you may not have thought of before. This is a little bit of a long explanation. There's a punchline at the end, so please just wait for it. Um, and my observation here, given my background um, working on virtual machines and language runtimes uh, for many, many years, um, the first thing I'd like to observe is translation is hard. And um, in many different contexts. So um, this is this is some art artwork from my my daughter. My daughter. I'll keep her head here at the bottom. So, <laughs> so no licensing problems. Um, so um, there's a German um, 
expression that uh, she told me. She is very playful with words, native German speaker, I'm not. Um, so she says, uh, she had this sort of joke that she told me at some point. Sagt der Walfisch zum Thunfisch, was wollen wir Thunfisch? Da sagt der Thunfisch zum Walfisch, du hast die Walfisch. Who speaks German here? Okay. All right. Who speaks English? That was a trick question. I mean, come on. All right, so, um, so for the German speakers in here, you probably recognize why this is sort of a, it's not really a joke, but why it's playful, right? So the, there's alliteration in here, there's sort of a way of, of constructing the sentence so that it makes you smile, right? Um, and the real question is, um, how do you translate that into English, right? How can I make this funny for people who don't speak German? Um, so <laughs> so I, I sent this to Google Translate, this is what you get, right? The whale to tuna says, what do we want to do fish? The tuna says to the whale, you have to choice fish. Wow. Technically correct, it's best kind of correct. Yeah. Um, so we can do better than this. And I thought about this for a while, and I'd appreciate feedback about how we can maybe do this better. Uh, but so here's, here's, um, here's my shot at this. The whale says to the tuna, what should we do now? The tuna replies to the whale, well, it's your choice. Okay? All right. You know. So, but the point here is that it's hard. And the reason it's hard is because to express something in a language is difficult. Because it's not just the literal meaning, it is also these other things that come with it. Humor, cadence, alliteration, all those things we sort of saw in that example. And they just don't let themselves be translated easily. Right? Um, and it turns out, here's my sort of um, oh yeah, homonyms here as well, um, right? So words that sound the same but have different meanings, that it's really hard to translate that because it doesn't always map. So turns out translation of computer language is almost just, oh, it's actually equally as hard. Um, and this is something that I've been sort of working on, on and off, uh, for um, the last sort of 25 years, and it still is really hard. Um, so same problems exist, um, it's sort of in a different flavor. So and it's a problem of expressiveness. If you have a computer language and you want to make it uh, work on a hardware computer, you have the sort of the raw, the specification of the language. What can it do? There's features of the language. But you also have, you know, you have to make sure that it's correct and you have to make sure that it's safe. You also have to make sure that it's fast and that it doesn't take too many resources. You have similar constraints on top of sort of this baseline that you have with real languages that if you don't have those properties, then it may not be as useful as you'd like, right? So this expressiveness problem exists for many different types of languages. Um, so, so a corollary to this, turns out implementing JavaScript is hard. I've been doing this for now, this particular task for like 10 years, and I think all the members of the VA team here, uh, if, who's, who's from the VA team here tonight? There's a couple, right? Who would agree that this is hard? Give it up. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this makes you look really stupid if you say <laughs> for real. Anyway, I, I think it's hard. And um, the reason is, and this is, um, uh, this is uh, uh, a diagram that I've shamelessly borrowed from a colleague who can make much better diagrams than I can. And, um, but this is what the, how it works in a simplified view. Um, so first of all, you start with your JavaScript code. We parse it. Remember I talked about this abstract syntax tree. We actually built one of those from your source code. We um, actually, we send it through an interpreter first. So we build bytecode for the interpreter that, uh, that will execute the JavaScript. Then we uh, send it through this feedback process. We get collect information as it's running through the interpreter, which allows us to optimize it uh, based on the feedback that we've gathered. And then we actually generate the machine code at the end for the optimized version that runs really, really fast. So this is sort of a complex pipeline here um, to get to running your code optimized at the bottom. Um, yeah, so uh, the reason I bring all of this up is that in order to do all that stuff right now, V8 is written in C++, right? It's not written in JavaScript. And you might think, whoa, boom, why would I write in JavaScript? There's quite a few languages who try to do this. It's sort of like the holy grail of a language is bootstrapping in your own language. Um, so, I mean, that, there's certain reasons why you would want to do that anyway, but it's actually um, it's a, sh a show of how powerful your language is to be able to actually express it in itself. But we don't do this in JavaScript. We don't write JavaScript in JavaScript. Why is that? Well, it's an expressiveness problem. Okay. Why do we not do this? Um, other languages do. Well, um, specifically, that part of this problem that I showed you is really exceedingly difficult to do in JavaScript, right? So 
Um, it is almost impossible to do this fast interpretation, um, gathering feedback, optimizing it, and turning it into machine code that you subsequently execute. Um, these steps, it just you just can't do that in JavaScript, right? You can't actually say, give me give me a buffer, I'm going to write some bytes, that's machine code, please execute it. That would be a huge security hole, right? <laughs> um, we actually have been exploited in that very same way in practice, but that's something that we try to make impossible, and it takes a lot of trickery, and sort of that's what the bad guys um, try to do, is figure out ways to do this when they're not supposed to be able to do it. Um, right, so by default, it's impossible to uh, express this in JavaScript. Um, so back to the third question, of which is why, would you, why do you need WebAssembly? Well, here's the punchline. This is the thing you're supposed to be waiting for. Um, WebAssembly is expressed enough to solve that rest of that box and other hard problems that JavaScript can't. So not only is WebAssembly useful to, for doing cross-compilation, um, which is the use case that most people talk about, C++ running on the web, but there are things you simply can't do with JavaScript that um, you can do with WebAssembly. So that is sort of the lead into um, a little bit of a thought experiment that um, I did last year, and I'd like to show you a little bit of how that works, which is how expressive can you get? Um, how can you use it? Well, let's actually try to build that missing part of the, um, the V8 picture that I showed you, that really hard part, simplified, yes. We're not gonna write all of the source code now. Otherwise, I guess my team, there's not much reason that my team exists if we were working on this and I could do 20 minutes in this presentation. But um, the idea is the same. Um, theoretically, you could do this at scale. Um, so, first, uh, a little bit of information. That first part of the tree where I said it was possible in JavaScript. Well, um, let's see how that would work. Because if we're going to build a whole pipeline with web tech, part of it we could do with uh, uh, JavaScript, and the other part, that hard part, we're going to do with WebAssembly. So, Take your JavaScript, we parse it, and we build the abstract syntax tree. So there's actually off-the-shelf components. Um, S Prima is one of those, which is a high-performance JavaScript, ECMAScript compliant parser um, written in JavaScript. And you can uh, use that thing to do those three boxes. So here I'm actually going to show you some source code, so either you know choose to to fall into your food coma, now would be the time, or uh, squint a little bit. The font's a little bit small here, but the, the details are not uh, that important. Um, the idea is what is uh, what I'd like to get across. So um, the idea is that if you take this uh, S Prima component and you write just a little bit of code, um, and that's this little bit of code here, you can take an input string, you parse it, and you get an AST back. AST is it's structured in a particular way that you can walk it easily from JavaScript. Um, we take that JavaScript that you provide as an input string, we parse it, and you get the AST. That's it. That's all you need, right? Of course, you need to import this component, but this is off the shelf, right? You can get this. Um, uh, this is a standard component that anybody can use, and it works really well. Um, so, in this particular uh, example, what I've done is I've added a, a print visitor, a visitor pattern to actually walk over that AST and print it out. Um, just so we can debug it and see what happens. So, um, yeah, so it's not really a demo. But <laughs> um, so uh, the example I'd like to show here, I'm showing the wrong presentation, I think. Um, so let's take this function on the right here, um, which is a valid JavaScript function, which is pretty straightforward. It just adds two numbers. And if you run through that program that I just showed before, that um, the code on the right, uh, the code on the left, or the, the, the description on the left is actually a text representation of the AST um, for this program on the right. Um, so it, the, at the top level, you have a node that's the program, and under that there's a body for the, um, the, the program, and then you have a function declaration, and under that you have the names, the parameters, and a whole bunch of other stuff. The details are not important here, but as the, the important part is as Prima just did this work for us and gave us this data structure that we can navigate through. Um, all right, so that's the top of, that was the easy part that we could do with JavaScript. Let's talk about how to do this part. And in fact, we're going to simplify it a little bit because it turns out that um, it still is really hard to do all of this in WebAssembly. Web so let's just try to do the compile part and the generate the machine code part. Um, assume that the sort of feedback stuff, all this other complicated stuff, that's not useful for this sort of demo or this thought experiment. So um, I'm not going to go into detail there. But theoretically, you can do that too. Um, so, uh, the nice thing is I showed you a picture before of a technology that does exactly this. It takes some representation, puts it through some mechanisms that we built in V8, 
it, we have this technology already in Chrome. You can take a WASM file, you put it through um, V8 and the web assembly engine, and you get a assembly for that. That looks a lot like the problem we need to solve over here. Now, the trick is we just have to get this file. We have to get the WASM file. And once we have that, we have this technology that we can just like apply, and then we'll get the fast machine code on the, on the other side. Make sense? Okay, people nodding. That's good. Um, if only for my ego. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, all right. So, what about the piece that's still missing? How do we turn the abstract syntax tree into a WASM file? Okay. Well, let's start with an assembly. So, basically, the idea is we want to output WebAssembly code. Um, so, all of this code is actually on a GitHub project that I can somehow provide later, so you can actually take a look at this. But um, I'm going to go into a couple of the highlights here. So if you create an assembler class, this assembler class, all, it's, uh, all it basically does is it allows you to uh, emit um, uh, pieces of WebAssembly code um, as you would read it in sort of the, the, um, in the, the mnemonic form. Uh, you'd be able to just say, emit a, a, a load, do this particular instruction, do this and other instruction. If you would emit a valid assembly, uh, WebAssembly uh, program, then at the end you could say, hey, give me the bytes for that. And that's a bytes that you could be written into a WASM file and used as a, in, in any WASM engine. So <clears throat> built one of these assembler things that allowed me to output some subset of the WebAssembly bytecode. Um, so this outputs the bytes to the, web, the file, and this uh, method here actually gets that content so we can save it off somewhere. Makes sense? This is pretty straightforward. I did not list all of the methods that you could actually, all of the opcodes that you can uh, emit to the assembler, um, but you can look at the spec and see which ones are, are relevant. Um, so, uh, for example, um, two of these is um, if, if you want to um, use the um, WebAssembly uh, get local, it's one of the WebAssembly bytecodes, what that does under the cover, so this is an implementation of the method in the assembler, it says emit this byte, um, then put out a comment into the uh, source code, and emit another, um, uh, the actual local number, I think it's, it's here, and do another comment. So this is not only just plain code, this is like commented code. Um, here's another bytecode, or uh, a WebAssembly code, uh, i32add, and again, it's just outputting some bytes that correspond to this WebAssembly operation. Make sense? So these are examples of the methods in the assembler. Um, yeah. Okay. So I had a print visitor before. You remember that? Print visitor allowed me to visit the tree and print the AST and print out the contents of the tree. I wrote another visitor, a compilation visitor. What this thing does is visits the, the AST and outputs the appropriate WebAssembly um, opcodes for the operations as it goes through the tree. Right, so in summary, it goes recursively through the AST, generating WASM code for each node. Um, because, remember I mentioned at the beginning, WebAssembly uses a stack machine. Turns out that, that um, fits very nicely with the model of a recursive visit of the AST, so we can just sort of assume the stack's there and the operations don't have to remember much of anything, they know the things they're going to operate on are already there and it can be very local in the way it emits code. Um, yeah, and expressions or var variables or arithmetic operators leave or take values on or from the stack. So the model I'm showing here is pretty simplified. You can imagine JavaScript's actually pretty complicated. I just implemented what was necessary to do this A plus B piece in the assembler. Um, so it's very overly simplified. Um, okay, so it sort of looks like this. Um, the compilation visitor um, creates an assembler, which we just talked about, and for visiting the nodes, it has this um, sort of, right, so you get the, uh, the AST in, and what it has is this dispatcher that for every node it, it, it has, it has this sort of um, dispatch table that actually calls a handler for each node type, um, and from that it uh, actually, um, depending on the node type, we'll, we'll call a function that, that does the appropriate thing, outputs the appropriate WASM code. Um, yeah, so that function declaration, so when I visit a function declaration node, you can see again here what it does. Um, it's relatively straightforward. Uh, if you've written a compiler, this sort of probably looks familiar. You go through each of the parameters that are going to be passed to that. These are uh, also things that we find on the AST. That's Prima did that for us. You push these things um, uh, on a, into a list, and then we output some code that uh, sort of boilerplate code in WebAssembly, this, this body, uh, pre-body, that is just stuff you need to actually define function in the WebAssembly format, and then we visit the body of the, um, 
the, the, the function that actually does the operations of the function, and then there's some epilogue that has to be written. But again, um, don't look at all the details here, squint a little bit, but the idea here is that for each of the nodes, there's something you need to do, and um, it's relatively straightforward to break this down, um, at least for the simple cases. Right? Again, here's another example for how uh, identifiers work. Um, the way uh, it was implemented is that um, in that function that I had, the A plus B, I only supported parameters. So I create a list of parameters in the function declaration that I can refer to, um, and in, if you see an identifier, it just looks it up in that list of parameters, and if it's not there, it crashes. So there's no local variables in this model. It's very, very simple. It only works when it's parameters. Anyway, again, don't sweat the details. The idea here is that to get something simple working in WebAssembly is pretty straightforward. Um, again, all right, so here's the same thing. Um, remember the names of the parameters for the function, and then visit the body, and here, when you actually look, uh, find a name or variable, assume it's a parameter, look it up. Okay. Um, yeah, so there's more stuff here. Uh, I think this is almost the complete implementation of the compile. Yeah, it's the complete implementation. So um, there you have to handle the return statement, um, which was part of the, the, the function I showed you, return A plus B, um, and the JavaScript function. And then uh, uh, you can see I support all the grand total of one operator in the binary expression is <laughs> zero plus. Um, so it's the absolute minimum needed to, to do this. And um, yeah, so for the return statement, it um, returns the value that's at the top of the stack and uh, calls the assembler to say, I'm done. And um, for the binary expression, it assumes that both arguments for the, uh, for the plus are already on the stack. So all it has to do is say, output the add. And it pops the add instruction in, in um, WebAssembly, just pops the top, uh, the top two arguments on the stack, adds them, and, and pushes the result. Lots of details on it. Who's following me still? <laughs> kind of pull through here. All right. Anyway, um, so if you step back of this a little bit, um, the idea here is we wrote a small amount of JavaScript code, um, but it doesn't have to be JavaScript code. You can write you can write any mechanism you want to output WASM code, but it was relatively straightforward to generate WASM code from some well-defined structure. In this particular case, in ASD. So don't sweat the details. But the idea here is that we could generate a WASM file, not just from C++ code, but from any sort of um, application-specific need that we might have. OK, now we have that file. What do we do? And I'm going to kind of fly over this, but um, here's sort of how this works in practice. You create the compilation visitor that I just showed you. Um, that's here. And then we, um, from uh, after we visit it with, from, with the AST, we have um, uh, we get the assembler from it, which has all the bytes that have been output. Um, from that, we actually instantiate a WebAssembly module from JavaScript from those bytes we just generated. This is what ends up happening. Um, from that example I showed you, A plus B, returning that, um, uh, you get the, on the left-hand side, we have the, the um, um, sort of simplified uh, WebAssembly, um, the text representation of the code that gets generated, and these are the actual bytes that get outputted. With the, these are the comments that I outputted. Those are the exact ones that you saw output comment in the, the, um, in the assembler. This, those are from these. So A plus B as a function, I put it through uh, as prima. I had the, the visitor, the compilation visitor. I took the output of the assembler, and this is what I got, basically what's on the uh, right-hand side. Here. Um, and the final generated code that you get, just to give you an example here, on the left, um, Chrome will produce the uh, on uh, at x64 the following code for a plus b, and on the right um, for uh, i32, um, and we also could also of course work for ARM or any of the platforms supported by uh, by v8, you would get uh, the corresponding very efficient machine code, right? Okay. The idea behind all of this is that when you think about WebAssembly, don't just think about the use cases that are sort of the traditional ones, the ones where we take a C++ program and we deploy it to the web. There's all sorts of things that you could do with WebAssembly that just were simply not possible before. Um, you could think of things on the client side like machine learning or high performance graphics, video compression, decompression, all sorts of crazy stuff that just wasn't um, possible before, including implementing computer languages. Right? Um, Overall, my takeaways. First one is you can do things now on the web with WebAssembly that were just not possible before. So when you start thinking about enabling your experiences on the web, think WebAssembly. It should be one of those tools in your tool chest to enable new experiences on the web. 
Um, it is extremely powerful, very expressive. And as I mentioned, um, you can build things that were just not possible before. That's it. <clears throat> Thank you. Do I take questions before or after I stop? Or do we, do we take questions? Um, yeah. Oh, yeah, sorry. There it is. So, anyone has questions to a demo? Wait a second. We have some benchmarks. So, the question is about benchmarks. Do you have benchmarks? Benchmarks for what? For what? A plus B? You mean with my, my implementation of JavaScript against V8 or... Uh, <laughs> or no, no, no. The evolution of uh, less, uh, less assembly at Google. Yeah. Um, yes, we have benchmarks. Um, it's pretty competitive. I will defer to Ben, who's the uh, TL of the virtual machine work here. Maybe that's something you can speak about or mention. Um, we are faster than we used to be. <laughs> in terms of raw performance, I think we're the best of the engines. There's a bit of a bit no, behind no, on no, the I'm talking not about comparing to others. I'm co comparing to yourself. What kind of solution you had over the last few years? Yeah, so um, when we launched, so there's a PLBI paper, you can look at benchmarks there. We were pretty close to native speed there, like within 20% for most of the benchmarks. There's a few outliers, and what we've mostly done is fix all the outliers. So some of the outliers got 2x faster, for example. But it's, there wasn't really anything that was like 10x slower, so there wasn't a 10x possible improvement. So we much got many outliers closer to native. That's pretty much the, the extent of the optimization that we've done. But the main improvement, which I will talk about, is the startup time has gotten a lot better. And what is the comparison? When you compare um, direct machine code compared to the interpreter? So we don't run an interpreter in production. We always compile WebAssembly. We have two production tiers. Um, it is typically less than 20% slower than native code, but there are outliers. There are some things that are right on the money at the same speed. There are a few things where we actually get a little bit, little bit closer, or a little bit faster than the code that, generate, uh, that is generated by the client, but those are typically where we got lucky. So it's usually like we are within 20%. More questions? Wait. Hey, thank you for the talk. Does the uh, implementation of uh, WebAssembly in hardware make sense? Does an implementation of WebAssembly in hardware make sense? Um, I, I won't answer that question because I think there's a great space to explore here. <laughs> I, I won't answer it depending on one or another. I can draw an experience from Similar situation 20 some years ago where Java bytecode, um, there were actually hardware devices that were proposed to execute that. And it turned out modern software based jitting systems, dynamic recompilation systems, it turned out to be categorically faster. So, never say never, but um, there's precedent for um, sort of not uh, building custom hardware for this stuff and just going through translation later. But again, I don't know. Maybe you want to say something there too. But uh. well, there's some challenges in interpreting WebAssembly fast because it wasn't designed for interpretation. So if you want to make, for example, to know where a branch goes, you have to have validated the code because it's not explicit in the code where a branch goes. So you imagine the CPU like has to validate the code and then it maybe has to have a side table. That said, I actually think that for the MVP set of of uh, WebAssembly, you could probably build a chip that would be pretty pretty fast, but the problem is that it evolves, and all the new bytecodes and new types and, and the evolution is not going to be there. And those things you would basically have to defer to software to do. So then you end up with some dynamic translation. So I don't know. I think it'd be really neat if, for example, for an embedded application, there was like a chip that just ran WebAssembly, but I don't think that that is going to be the future of WebAssembly that is in the hardware. Any more questions? Hi, um, thanks for the talk. And so, by taking the lowest common denominator of everything of all platforms, making it available for all platforms, right? You have to have some common denominator. 
aren't you eroding all the benefits of having nativeness? Like, I'm still like struggling to like. I, I see, of course, a lot of potential in WebAssembly, but. <laughs> So there's no quite question. Yeah, the like, <laughs> like, where do you see like the, the 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 like? How does it not repeat the mistakes of the past of projects and things trying to exa exactly this something very similar of white ones run everywhere? Um, that's that's a good question. Um, I think one of the things that makes this particularly powerful is the fact that it um, you can find it in it's a standard that all the browsers use. So it, it is more ubiquitous, I think, than anything else. So you can assume that if you have Chrome on the platform, it will work. And that's, that's maybe a different place that we're in now than we were in when that, that, that statement became famous, right? Um, also, one of the, uh, the, the divisions, or, or sort of one of the important distinctions that was made is WebAssembly is an execution engine at the lowest level, but it doesn't say much about the, the platform that you provide. And the nice advantage to the way things are now is that you can use the advantages of the existing web platform, which has a long sort of tried and true history. Um, so with that combination, we've solved a piece of the problem that was useful to solve, but you can leverage off of all this other stuff that has already shown to be super useful and has a huge sort of uh, development community, community in the web platform. So. Um, there's certainly risks there, but I think that the landscape is different and sort of the technologies that are available and which part of the problem this is solving is a little bit different than what has been tried in the past. Another question. Your use case in the beginning was about starting old windows in the modern browser. So it's kind of having the win for the user. I'm the owner of the browser and I start something and I get something out of it. What about the scenario where the provider or the server side provides some software which is running on the browser at some end users <laughs> and the results I get back to the server. So I'm pretty sure it is possible because we know, for example, Bitcoin miners running in JavaScript and browser. But are there any peculiarities for the web SM? to allow this or to optimize this, uh, sharing results with the server? Um, so let me take a step back. I think it has been possible for a long time to execute code on a client, um, so in your browser, right? JavaScript has done this for a long time. And the platform builds in safeguards and sort of also has a security model that um, it tries to sort of protect the user from, from egregious use of their, um, you know, violation of their privacy and uh, breaking security rules. WebAssembly doesn't change that fundamental equation. It makes it possible to run things faster. So you can still sort of fall back on the general um, trust that you have in your browser, which I think is uh, really important when you have a powerful technology like this, that it doesn't fundamentally change the security equation. Um, uh, that being said, certain things are powerful, and there are, there I believe, that, I mean, there are Bitcoin miners that are out there, but you could do that uh, within WebAssembly, but it, you could do that in JavaScript as well. It may not be economical because it might not be fast enough, but um, sort of, I don't know if it really um, changes the equation enough that um, those type of things are, uh, uh, at least in the browser, would, would make sense or changes what can be done. Yeah. I don't know. I, Someone else? Um, what, uh, uh, what's the major difference with LVM uh, bit code? It's in a similar spot. Um. So, uh, a couple things. So, LLVM bit code is not really designed to be jitted. I mean, there's been work to do that, but um, and it's not necessarily completely generic, right? So, WebAssembly is really something that um, is universally deployable, and the LLVM bit code isn't quite that mechanism. It wasn't sort of designed to solve these problems. For example, converting that, with WebAssembly, it's very easy to very quickly convert that into machine code that is very fast. So startup time can be guaranteed. That wasn't necessarily a design goal of LLB uh, bit code. So it is a very powerful tool, but whether it solves this problem in this way, universally, um, not really. Um, 
but I, that's something certainly, yeah, I mean, it's, there are similar ideas that have been tried and are out there. Okay, and um, in your talk you said um, the holy way for all languages is to, uh, to bootstrap in, uh, in their own language. You didn't really explain on that why it's hard to do or impossible to do with JavaScript. Uh, maybe that was just a side. Yeah. Uh, so I, there's, there's context there. I think the trick about uh, the reason that uh, B is in, Java, uh, is in C++ is because it's not just that the language isn't expressive enough, but we have further constraints. We have memory constraints, and we also have speed constraints. You want to optimize for startup. And the problem with uh, JavaScript is because it's not strongly typed, this is one of many challenges that you have, because it's not strongly typed. When you start executing JavaScript, it's really difficult to optimize it unless you run for a while. So in general, you have a problem that you can't start up as quickly um, with large applications as you could with a system that already has a lot of this information sort of statically compiled. Um, WebAssembly sort of bridges that gap because you know the strong typing of WebAssembly um, operations at deployment time already when you load the WebAssembly file. But in JavaScript, you can have a variable and we don't know until you execute it. And let that, if it's a string or if it's an integer, we have to figure that out. And that makes it, it creates challenges um, to actually make a um, sort of a meta circular environment that bootstraps itself in a way that's not totally slow. Right? That's one of the constraints we have is to make it fast. I think one last question, and then we have a yes. like five to ten minute break up to you. <laughs> So first of all, thank you for your talk. Um, two questions, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, how much performance um, do you th performance penalty do you think a WebAssembly can reach in the future? So right now we're about twenty percent. That's what you said. How much uh, will you think will never be reachable because of its sandboxing, because of its um, structure? Uh, so. There's a little bit of overhead introduced for C code because the way you compile uh, what, like addressable variables onto the stack means you have to put them into memory. So you basically burn a register there. We burn a register for a context that goes to the code. So your code is kind of handicapped by two registers, machine registers. And we use virtual memory tricks so we don't have to compile any balance checks or anything like that. Um, there's a couple indirections for doing indirect function calls that are a little bit more expensive. But those are basically the costs that you pay. If you have really hot loops and you stay in them, we should be able to generate machine code that is like the same speed as a native compiler. Um, if we do dynamic optimization in the future, maybe we can do a bit more. We can also do dynamic inlining, things that you can do in static compilation. So I think we're pretty close to being on par. I don't think that WebAssembly is ever going to be much faster than a static compiler, maybe 10% if we throw all the, all the dynamic optimization machinery that we have at it. I mean, I don't think it'll be any more than 10% slower, so we'll probably stay in those bands. Perfect. Thank you so much. You already answered the second question as well. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Tina. So let's have a 10-minute break, and then I'm looking forward to Ben's talk. Um, he's the lead of the WebAssembly team here at Munich, as far as I know, and should share with us some interesting insights. <laughs>